Start with the reading of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna from the portion which we have in, in, where we have ended in the last class. It's a very pertinent question which a devotee is asking to the master, to Sri Ramakrishna. What is the good of holy companion? The master, it begets yearning for God, it begets love of God. Nothing whatsoever is achieved in spiritual life without yearning. By constantly living in the company of holy men, the soul becomes restless for God. As we were indicating in the last class, but when we, for the first time, meet a holy person, the first thing that attracts us is the equipoise the compassion, the serenity of the human soul. And then the question comes that how a person can attain such an equipoise, such a serenity? How can he have so much of compassion? What's the source? And then we find that he is absolutely absorbed in the divine and that has totally transformed his personality. And then the question comes that if, because by thinking of God, one can become so godly, one can internalize the values which you're thinking, then is it not worthwhile to really aspire for it? And that's how the aspiration for the divine, the yearning for the love of God that develops seeing the role model of the holy person, so role model in the form of the holy man, in whose presence, in whose association, we gradually start spending more and more time. So that's what he's saying. It begets yearning for God. It begets love of God. Nothing whatsoever is achieved in spiritual life without yearning. By constantly living in the company of holy men, the soul becomes restless for God. This yearning is like the state of mind of a man who has someone ill in the family. His mind is in a state of perpetual restlessness. This yearning is like a state of mind of a man who has someone ill in the family. His mind is in a state of perpetual restlessness, thinking how the sick person may be cured. Or again, one should feel a yearning for God, like the yearning of a man who has lost his job and is wandering from one office to another in search of work. If he is rejected, at a certain place, which has no vacancy, he goes there again in the next day and inquires, is there any vacancy today? So here, Sri Ramakrishna, what he's indicating, that as long as spirituality is just an option, 
as long as spirituality is just a matter of luxury. As Swami Vivekananda used to say nicely, that most probably in my house, there are a lot of antiques. And I find that there are no such antiques from the Buddhist culture. I have antiques from so many cultures, so many traditions. And so I go in search of a Feng Shui or a laughing Buddha. And that is just one of the antiques among the many to show people that I have so many antiques. For most of us, spirituality is just an identification. When we are in a social gathering, we just can discuss. Someone says, I am associated with such and such religious group. So in response, I should have to say something. And we also say, oh, I, I also belong to such and such tradition. Oh, this tradition is great. That tradition is great. And it becomes just a matter of discussion, like any other worldly uh, way of identifying something so as to increase my face value, so as to increase my, as if my worth, we sometimes use the religion. So here what Sri Ramakrishna is indicating that religion is not an option. It's not just a luxury. It's not just a matter to identify with so as to increase my face value, my market value, like, like the way I do with my job, with my wealth, they are there to put a tag around me that I have such and such value, that my market price is such and such. But religion is not meant for that. It is meant to really yearn for it so that the real transformation in your life happens. So it's not just an option. It's not an option. When I feel it is essential, just the way a fish fills out of water, do I feel that way? If the spirituality, which I profess to be my be all and end all of my existence, without which I cannot stay, if it makes me feel like a fish out of water, then know it for certain, it is going to bring a immense transformation in our life. Most of us complain that I, resort, I have resorted to a spiritual life, but no change as such happens. So that's why Sri Ramakrishna in the very beginning have asked that, do you feel the attraction just the way a miserly person feel for his wealth? A chest wife feels for his husband, the mother feels for his child. The, the, those type of attractions, if you can just add them up, that type of intensity, if you have for God, know it for certain, realization is just waiting for you, is just there knocking at your door. It is bound to happen. So that's why to stress that point is again saying that yearning is the primary factor, but to get that yearning, holy company is necessary. By staying with a, a holy person, in companion with the holy person, seeing his life totally imbibed with, imbued with the divine, totally drenched with the divine, we also gradually develop that type of attitude, that type of temperament, and slowly, just by being associated with the holy man, we find our life is changing. Because after all, we all uh, are in search of real transformation. The world is full of advertisement. When we are in the presence of a holy man, as Sri Ramakrishna used to say, that see the holy man day in and day out. There cannot be any part-time spirituality, that I'm just spiritual for the part of my day, the rest of the day, I'm quite busy with my secular activities. Spirituality cannot be that way. So when you are with a holy person and see that it is possible to live a life totally, just forgetting, forsaking every other so-called security zone, your only security, your only comfort zone, your security zone becomes the divine. That we always say that uh, human beings are social beings. We cannot stay without society. Especially in the time of COVID, we have realized how difficult it is to be without the social interaction. That's why we find the day when uh, the 
lockdown has been uplifted, is released. Immediately at night, 12 o'clock, you go to all the shops, the Kmart, everywhere. There's a throng of people at 12 a.m. At night, 12 a.m., when the lockdown has been relaxed, the people were, at, were just waiting for socializing. Why? That we, we are a social being. But one thing we forget, that when I am in presence of someone else, I feel good. I feel I am with someone whom I like. But what actually makes me feel, what actually makes me feel good? It's not the person, it's actually the subjective feeling that I am in association with someone and that gives me comfort, that gives me a sense of security. It's not the person, real person, it's actually the subjective feeling. And there is the catch point in our life if we can make God our be all and end all of our existence, if we can just practice the presence of divinity in each and every moment of our life, that God is with me. He is always there. As someone was indicating that I am at home, I am just alone. My Husband has passed away. Children are all established. I find that even to keep my home tidy is meaningless. So if you were just suggesting, why not think that it is not your home? You are just the caretaker. It is the divine who stays there. It is his home. It is he who is moving around everywhere. It is for his sake. You keep the house tidy. And then even the secular job, like keeping the house tidy, keeping your surroundings tidy, neat, clean, becomes a spiritual endeavor. It no more remains just a secular activity. That's why Sri Ramakrishna always used to indicate this fact that nothing is secular. Everything is spiritual. It needs just a change in the orientation. We find that day-to-day -day activities can really be a very spiritually uplifting thing if you change that orientation. You can just every day household. And when I'm the cooking, that why we offer it to the divine? The same purpose. It's not for me, for the divine. So the cooking, even the simple act like cooking becomes a worship. You do it perfectly, offer it to the divine, and then you have it as a consecrated food. You're doing the same worldly thing, but you have just changed the attitude. And then what happens? You don't feel alone. It's the thing, as we have totally forgotten. We have we never considered the divine to be a part of our life. There is so much of psychological issues. With all the counseling, at last we find it is of no help. Because the basic thing, the commonsensical thing is, it is not the person who gives me a sense of security, who gives me a sense of happiness. It is a subjective feeling that I am with someone. We can through our practice can have that subjective feeling when we are constantly contemplating on the divine. And you don't need, yes, we are a social being, socialize with God. And that's the thing Sri Ramakrishna is saying. And one who has started socializing with the divine, for him, there is no other option. They feel as if like a fish out of water. If they cannot, for some reason or other, have the contemplation of the divine. As I was indicating in the last class, we were that when Sri Ramakrishna, along with Mathu, went to Varanasi, Kashi. So he had the idea that Varanasi is a holy place, that the people are always 24 hours in a holy place like Varanasi, the Shiva Khetra, where Shiva is the king, Shiva is the deity there. So all the people there are devoted to Shiva. They're constantly in the wash, they're always engaged in the worship of the divine. And going there, he found people are just busy with the ordinary worldly affairs. Not only that, one day Mathu, with whom Sri Ramakrishna went to uh, Kashi, he along with his friend was having some worldly discussion. And Sri Ramakrishna started crying. He was crying in front of them. He was like a small boy and wailing. What he was saying, that, oh mother, at last, 
Why have you brought me here? I was quite well at Dakshineshwar. I thought that in Kashi, all are devoted to the divine. Here also I find the same, that worldly person and the same worldly talk going on. So they feel totally out of water. So that tremendous yearning. That's why in Bhakti Shastra, Viraha has been called the highest, highest uh, evolution in the state of divine Viraha, the sense of separateness. Why? There's a, a little separated, a, a little moment of separateness from the divine makes you feel as if you are gasping for breath. Just the way I cannot stay without air, I cannot stay without the communion with the divine. So that's what he's indicating. And that happens when we are always in holy association. Gradually we will find that this becomes the be all and end all of our existence. Sri Ramakrishna continues continuing. There is another way, earnestly praying to God. God is our very own. We should say to him, O oh God, what is thy nature? Reveal thyself to me. Very interesting thing he's saying. You will find that those who profess to be spiritual, throughout the world, you open, nowadays it, it, you can palpably feel it. You open the channels, YouTube, spiritual lectures, you will find it is so abstract. All are trying to say God is this, God is not this. God is, uh, we are trying to define God. We try to say that God is for getting, for realizing God, this is the only way. And these are all abstract ideas. We waste our time only in all those theology. 99% of the people who profess them to be spiritual is actually wasting time in mere theology. The essential thing in spiritual life is to develop that love. Once you have developed that love, you are blessed. You need not know what actually is the real nature of God. We can never know. Is infinite. Sri Ramakrishna again and again is saying that it is to develop that love for the divine. So if you are constantly busy with the idea that what God really is, you are actually wasting your time with some abstract philosophizing. It in no way starts transforming your life. So to forget about that, what a nice prayer he's teaching us. That, oh God, I don't know what you are. It is you, you, you yourself, you reveal thyself to me. For me, I'm just praying. So God is never bothered that how we call on him, what's his idea, what, what is our idea about him. It is only the love that helps us to have communion with the divine. Sri Ramakrishna gives a wonderful example in some other place. Suppose a father has five children and the youngest one is yet to speak, has, is, is yet to uh, develop vocabulary, has not yet started speaking. And seeing others calling father, he somehow calls ba or pa, a single syllable. Does the father get angry with the child? He's so happy that he's trying in his best, in his whatever limited way is available to him, he's trying to relate to the father. Does the father get angry that as he's not calling him properly? So we, in the name of spirituality, waste our time by saying what you believe is not correct, what you believe, what I believe is true. What? So these are all useless. The real thing is that yearning. Even if the way, the path which you have chosen as such, may be a very, very crude form of belief, it is immaterial. If the real love is there, know it for certain, God is like a beggar. God like a beggar is eternally waiting for that love. It is he who is the beggar. It is he who is waiting. It is not we who want to love God. It is God who is eternally waiting for us to turn towards him. It is he who is begging for that love. That little love in whatever form we develop, it is 
he will come running. That's why in every religious tradition, in whatever will be the language, the idea is if you proceed one step towards God, he will come 100 steps. So that's the thing, how nicely that prayer is said is another way, earnestly praying to God. God is our very own. We should say to him, oh God, oh God, what is thy nature? Reveal thyself to me. So that way you are not bothered about the so-called the theological aspect of all the philosophical dis discussion. You want to reach God directly. As Sri in the words of Sri Ramakrishna in some other place, that what's the use in counting leaves? Eat mangoes. The two friends went to a mango orchard and they were told that one hour time is there. You can just go, go around, uh, eat mangoes, whatever you want, you can do. One of the friends didn't waste time. Immediately just climbed the tree and there was it was all laden with the ripe mangoes. He started eating mangoes. And another friend just took a notebook and was just counting how many leaves each branch has, uh, how many twigs it has. So who is the clever one? That's what Sri Ramakrishna is asking. That as if you have got, if you have got the entry to that mango orchard, just be the clever one. Eat the mangoes. Don't waste your time in counting leaves. Counting leaves means all those theological discussions. Have the taste of the divine. And that's what Sri Ramakrishna is indicating. Thou must, then Sri Ramakrishna is showing that how we should pray. We should have a tremendous, uh, what's it, a demand on the divine. It's not that meekly we should pray. Thou must show thyself to me. For why else hast thou created me? If you have created me, you have to just be in my presence. Some sick devotees once said to me, God is full of compassion. I said, but why should we call him compassionate? He's our creator. What is there to be wondered at if he is kind to us? Parents bring up their children. Do you call that an act of kindness? What nice way Sri Ramakrishna is saying. That the parent look up to the children. Do we call it kindness? It is the duty. Similarly, if God has created us, he is our parent, it is his duty to just take care of us, to be uh, in association with us. So that's what he's indicating. So you should demand. They must act that way. Therefore, we should force our demands on God. He is our father and mother, isn't he? It, if the son demands his patrimony and gives up food and drink in order to enforce his demand, then the parents hand his share over to him three years before the legal time. Or when the child demands some pies from his mother and says over and over again, mother, give me a couple of pies. I beg you on my knees. Then the mother, seeing his earnestness and unable to bear it anymore, tosses the money to him. So Sri Ramakrishna used to say a very interesting thing. What he's indicating here, that in our scriptures, we speak of three gunas, sattva, raja, tama. Sattvic is that equipoise. Many of us, by temperament, is equipoise, com contemplative, resorting to studies. So those are the sattvic nature, always calm. Rajasic are the one who are extremely active, have a lot of ambition, goals, worldly goals, worldly ambition, rajasic. And tamasics are the one who are either uh, lazy, indolent, or gets angry without any reason. This is anger and other things are misdirected. They're more obsessive by nature. What they do doesn't serve any purpose. Just out of obsession, they do this tamas. So anger is a form of tamok. So here what Sri Ramakrishna is saying is something interesting. That generally we say that we have, to, we have to get rid of the tamas and rajas and get established in sattva. Here what Swar Ramakrishna is saying is very interesting. That we need not reject tamas, rajas. Let them be there. Why not channelize them? If I have anger, why should I be angry with some, for some silly reasons? 
let me be angry with God that why are you not just giving me this realization? Why are you not transforming my life? Why are you not establishing me in spirituality? So that is a bhakti tam. You can channelize, sublimate the anger. So instead of trying to get rid of tamas in the form of rage and anger, why not sublimate it into the intense aspiration? So all the three gunas can help us to evolve spiritually. Like from rajas comes pride. So there is Swami Vivekananda when he returned from the West in India, throughout India when he was delivering lecture. In many places he told, I am, if anyone is the proud man in this world, I am the one who is very proud. You know why? Because I am the disciple of Ramakrishna. Just see, this is the pride, that I am the child of the God. If you have to have pride, have that type of pride. Sublimate that I am not proud for my wealth, for my uh, position in life. I am proud because I am the son of the divine. My guru is Ramakrishna. So that is the rajas, the bhakti rajas. You can channelize. So all the three gunas can be channelized and that can help us to evolve spiritually. You do not have to force them out. You can sublimate them. And that's the easier way. If we find that when the river is flowing uh, in the rainy season, uh, the, the river may overflow. And that's why generally we build dam. But nowadays building dam is not considered a good option. Because if the rain is too much, the, break, the dam may break or we may have to open up the log gates and it will be flooding the lands. So what's the better way? Instead of constructing dam, why not channelize? You could just construct many channels and to take those channels to the dry and arid areas. Like in India, when the Ganges is coming down, instead of constructing dam, why not just channelize the water to Rajasthan, to the desert areas, where when there's an excess of rain, it is those lands which are dry, arid, they get, for, they get sufficient water and you can cultivate those lands, you can irrigate those lands. So that's a better option. So in spiritual life also, to force, to just forcefully stop all our impulses can be, uh, have, it can wreck us. It can wreck us psychically. It can wreck us physically. There, there are so many cases of mental derangements when we try to force. So here what Sri Ramakrishna is saying is a wonderful thing. You need not have to force all these impulses just change the direction, give it towards the divine. And then that instead of harming us is going to help us evolve spiritually and it has helped us to integrate our personality. So that's what Sri Ramakrishna is, that enforce his, just what he's saying, that he's our father and mother, isn't he? If the son demands his patrimony and gives up food and drink in order to enforce his demand, then the parent hand his share over to him three years before the legal time. Or when the child demands some pies from his mother and says over and over again, mother, give me a couple of pies. I beg you on my knees. Then the mother, seeing his earnestness and unable to bear it anymore, tosses the money to him. So this is the bhakti, the tamo of bhakti. That instead of harming, actually helps us. There is another benefit of holy kandha. So. Sri Ramakrishna is just showing one by one the various benefits of holy company. It helps one to cultivate discrimination. So here Sri Ramakrishna will find that he in his simple word is speaking of the sadhana chatushtaya, which we speak of as the preliminary practice in the Vedanta way of uh, spiritual life. So what he's saying? if helps to cultivate discrimination between the real and the unreal. God alone is real. That is to say the eternal substance and the world is unreal. That is to say transitory. So he is actually defining the word unreal. 
Unreal means not imaginary. It means it is transitory. Nothing is there which is permanent, changing. But God is eternal. He is the only real. So this speaks of Viveka, the first practice of the Sadhana Chatushtra, the fourfold spiritual practice. It starts with the discrimination. First, you have the sense of discrimination. Then only you can have renunciation. If you know that world is transitory, God is real, then only I can think of renouncing what is transitory and, and attaching, associating myself more and more with what is real. So that from Viveka comes renunciation. When I know the world is transitory, the naturally the question comes, why should I hold on to something which is transitory? So this renunciation is the vairagya that comes automatically. Viveka, vairagya. As soon as a man finds his mind wandering away to the unreal, he should apply discrimination. The moment an elephant stretches out its trunk to eat a plantain tree in a neighbor's garden, it gets a blow from the iron goad of the driver. So here, with a simple example, what he's speaking of, that after Viveka Vairagya comes, Shama Dhamma Uparati. Shama means controlling the mind. Dhamma means controlling the senses. Uparati, that when you're practicing to control the mind, now and then, the mind may again get distracted, just the way when the elephant stretches out its trunk, Uparati is like the, the driver's iron goat. You again bring it back constantly. There should be a vigilance. You, whenever the mind gets distracted, again and again, that, that itself becomes a sanskara. In one go, no one can become spiritual. You have to train your mind. And this mind, as the mind as the master, is a tyrannical, the most tyrannical master. It can simply drag you and kill you. But if you can make it your servant, it is the most obedient servant. And that can be done by this Shama Dhamma Uparati. First comes the control of the mind, then the senses. Just when you have the way, when you have to, when you're driving at a tremendous speed. So first you have to remove what you say that the, your leg from the accelerator and then you have to give it the brake. So what's this removing of the accelerator means speaks, speaks of Shama. So you are no more engaging your mind to the senses and then the, then after that, after you have disengaged the mind because of its past impulse, still it will, though your mind is disengaged because of its past impulse, still it will tend to go towards the objects of the senses. So now for that, the break has to be applied, the dharma has to be there. And th uh, though you will be successful for the time being, the old patterns, the old uh, way of life will again and again lurk you to go back to the old ways and constantly have to be vigilant to bring back the mind. That's the uparati. So that's what Sri Ramakrishna, how nice in a simple way, he's saying, as soon as a man finds his mind wandering away to the unreal, he should apply discrimination. The moment an elephant stretches out its trunk to eat a plantain tree in a neighbor's garden, it gets a blow from the iron board of the driver. That's how gradually you bring the mind under your control. Why does a man have sinful tendencies? The neighbor asks the next question. The one who came to the came to Dakshineshwar, so he's asking, why does a man have sinful tendencies? Master, in God's creation, there are all sorts of things. He has created bad men as well as good men. It is he who gives us good tendencies, and it is he again who gives us evil tendencies. It's a wonderful idea. Here we find there's a uniqueness of the Vedanta. In other religions, especially the dualistic religions, I won't say only the Abrahamic religions, even uh, in, the, uh, in our so-called the Hindu uh, fold, those who have the dualistic idea, there we find that Papa Punya, this both, this, they're speaking of this uh, Papa Punya, as if they're there's a dichotomy. 
between good and bad. But in this Vedanta, in Vedantic religion, there is no Satan. That there is no fight between God and Satan. The entire creation is his. The good also is an expression of the divine. The evil also is an expression of the divine. Everything is potentially divine. <laughs> evil as such doesn't exist. But we say, well, there's so much of evil I see. See, in Vedanta they say that evil is actually the expression of the fact that the potentiality couldn't be realized. Potentiality of divinity is already there. To give an example, a small seed has the potentiality to grow up into a huge banyan tree. So sorry, it's just seed just like a master seed, it can grow into a huge banyan tree. So it has the potentiality of becoming that huge banyan tree. If, but if that seed is in a land which is clogged with water, what will happen? That seed will get rotten. If that seed is in a dry place, it will get dried up. Does the dry seed or the rotten seed speaks of evil? No. It speaks of that somehow it couldn't get the favorable circumstances for the potentiality to manifest. So good, the difference between good and evil is that, that each and every being has the divinity as a potentiality. But if it doesn't get the scope to manifest in the proper channel, it finds expression as evil. It is the same divinity which is finding expression as good and evil. To give a common example, the example which you will find can be applied to all field of life. That what makes us happy? What makes us happy? We say the fulfillment of desires makes us happy. It's a common notion that I have tremendous desire. The fulfillment of the desire makes us happy. I feel the, the things which I need, that want is gone when I get the thing, is a thing which has made me happy. Whether it is an external object or is it a relation, I want to be in relation with such and such person or I want wealth or I want position. It's all external things which I want. Once the want is satisfied, I am happy. As if those are the things which has given me happiness. But is it the fact? Even you will agree, it never happens that way. How that happiness emanates in our psyche. Swami Vivekananda is giving a very nice example. From here, you will find that what actually is good and what is evil. That to have happiness, to, uh, to enjoy, to have a joy, any form of joy, even the most crudest form of joy, which we say is sin, is actually because the divine who is all bliss is trying to find expression. What's happening? The Swami Vivekananda in a very nice way is giving an example. Our mind is like a lake. All our thoughts, our desires are like the waves. There are so many innumerable waves of the mind. You have all noticed when a lake or a reservoir is having a lot of waves. Can you see the bottom? You can never see the bottom. The lake has to be calm to see the bottom. So Swamiji very nicely saying that what he's saying that when uh, my mind is agitated, I can never see the bottom of the mind. My real nature, as in a form of allegory, Swamiji is saying that my real nature Sat Chit Ananda Swarup is as if like the bottom of the lake, is in the bottom of the mind. What it is, we all know that scripture says it is Sat Swarup, Chit Swarup, Ananda Swarup. What it means, it, it, these are the not attributes of the absolute. These are the negation of the idea of limitation of our existence which we have. Sat means what? Trikal Avadita Satya. That which was, which is, which will be. Existence is sat, that existence which has no interruption, either in past, present, future. So we say, when I say that I am sat, it's a negation of the fact that I was born at a certain point of time, before that I didn't exist, I will die at a certain point of time, 
beyond which I am not going to exist. That's the idea which we have. The scripture says, no, you're sub. Means this idea that you are a limited being as per the time is concerned is wrong. You are eternal. You were, you are, you will be. Immediately after that, the doubt comes. Yeah, it's correct. What he's saying is correct. That after all, this energy and matter is interconvertible. It's like a river flowing. Somehow, some matter conglomerated to give the expression as life. When I die, all my body, this what all conglomerates as my body, they will again uh, will, will mix up with the soil, will mix up with this environment. They are still there, not as me, but they are there. So we have an idea as matter and energy, we are all eternal. So here again to scripture to negate that idea brings the idea of chit. That is not as matter and energy. Is the consciousness and consciousness alone, which is your real nature. That such swarup is chit swarupa. It is the consciousness, which is your real nature. And when again the doubt comes, okay, if what scripture says is correct, then most probably my existence is extremely miserable. Through eternity, I am just in a wave. Sometime in the peak of the wave, I'm very happy. Next moment, I fall in the ebb, totally depressed and full of sorrow. And that goes on eternally. Again, to negate that idea, the scripture speaks of Ananda Swarupata, that you are always in bliss. Then why do we suffer? The suffering is not something which is the essence of our existence. Why we suffer? Swami Vivekananda is giving this nice example that when the lake has waves, I cannot see the bottom. Similarly, when my mind is full of desires, thoughts, the Sat Chits Ananda Swarupata of these three, Ananda Swarupata gets obscured. The Sat Swarupata, the Chit Swarupata never gets obscured. I am always aware I am. When I am in abject misery, then also I am aware I am. I am. When I am in happiness in, and in joy, I am enjoying the life, then also know, I know I am. So Sat Swarupata, Chit Swarupata never gets obscured. What gets obscured is Ananda Swarupata, the bliss factor. Now what happens when I am having a very intense desire for something? All my small waves of the desires, they have got engulfed by the big desire. I want this, the latest model car I want. And by taking loan or whatever, in whatever way, at last you manage to get that car and you feel extremely elated. What has happened? All the small desires were engulfed by the big desire. The moment it gets fulfilled, for the time being, there is no desire. The mind is calm. There are no waves. Just the way when the lake is calm, I can see the bottom. So now here also when the lake of your mind is calm, the Ananda Swarupata percolates through your mind, through your senses. It's a let go always. It's not the achievement of your object of desire that gives happiness. It's the let go that ensues on the achievement that gives us happiness. Can you deny it? You're so jaded you will find that in life, all this happiness came from that let go. The moment the desire was fulfilled, then this world has no capacity to give us happiness. It's all advertisement. The entire nature has no capacity. Happiness mm -hmm. is something innate in us. When the mind that let go ensues, it calms down for the time being, that happiness wells up. It wells up world is very important. That where if you pump out all the water from the well, you did not have to pour in water again to fill it. There is underground water will well up. Similarly, the bliss which is already within, that wells up when you can vacate your mind. It wells up. And, when it, and we are doing it constantly in the form of all fulfillment of small desires. And why this obsession for the fulfilling of the small desires is called evil? Because once the desire is fulfilled for the time being the let go has come in, again we go for another desire. And this way we get 
bound up in the cycle of avidya karma karma. I forgot that the bliss is within. I forgot it. And that's why constantly I'm desiring for something. When the desire is fulfilled, the bliss is coming out from within. But because of ignorance, I think it is coming from there. And this makes me move again and again in the chain, in the chain, in the cycle of this avidya karma karma. And that is evil. Why? If I knew the bliss is already within, I would have just tried to keep my mind calm, let go. That to be always in the eternal now, not what actually worries us, the past and the future. In present, I, nothing is there to bother me. Most of the time in our life, we will find that in the past, I thought what will happen to me. And when I, when I am, when the future has become the present, then I'm quite okay. All those worries were unnecessary. Throughout our life, so many, as we will find that all our worries are so unnecessary wastage of time. We are, we manage with our life quite well if we are called in the eternal now at peace with ourselves. So here you will find what's evil and what's good. All the evil is actually, that motivation is good. You're trying to realize that bliss which is divine, but you're doing it in a wrong way. What's the wrong way? All small, small desires I fulfill, just momentarily I get that happiness and it becomes an obsession again to go to another desire. And that's how I became an obsessed, a machine which is obsessed with these desires, fulfillment of desires again and again. And this obsession can be so strong, which can turn into all illicit activities, criminal activities. Now you'll find that what is evil? Evil is as such not evil. It is all are searching for that bliss. In this world, if anyone has a common goal, that's the only goal. No one wants suffering. Everyone wants happiness. And it's quite good. But we are trying to get that happiness in the wrong way. Because that is never going to give us a permanent happiness. It's just momentary. So now you will understand where Sri Ramakrishna is saying that God has made both good and evil. Yes, is the same motivation to manifest the bliss of the divinity, which is acting in the evil person as well as in the holy person. The holy person knows the secret. He knows that it is not by extending our hand to just the begging from the nature to fulfill our desire. In that way, we can never get that happiness. The moment that you know that the happiness is within and you allow the mind to be at poise, at just like a tranquil river or a tranquil ocean, then that bliss is something which wells up from within. And that's, again, is what is good. So both the good and the evil has the same motivation of the bliss, of the joy. We are just taking the wrong path, that makes it evil. That's why Swami Vivekananda used to say a very nice thing, that actually this, uh, what you say, this good and evil, uh, they are not, the difference between the good and evil lies in degree, not in kind. It's in degree, means when I am not yet evolved, I'm still in ignorance, and then I search for the joy, that's okay. But I am taking the wrong way. That will never give me happiness. That will actually lead to suffering. But if I know the correct way, then only I can get joy. That we all want to eat mangoes. There are two walls. And there's a, a mango tree uh, near the two walls. And we all want to eat the mangoes. Now hurriedly, I kept a ladder on one of the wall and climbed up. After climbing up, I find the, man the branch of the mango tree is far away. I cannot reach out. And then I realized if I would have kept the ladder on the other one, the mango would have been in my reach. So in the, as for the effort is concerned, both are same. You place the ladder, you climb up, for both the uh, wall, it is the same. It's only the which in one which wall you keep the ladder that makes the difference. So the orientation. So once in our life, if we have this orientation that through the worldly enjoyment I'm going to have joy, knowing for certain you have kept the ladder on the wrong wall. It's never going to you find the mango is far away. Keep it. This is the correct. 
it's correct wall. So what is the correct wall? It's to develop the love for the divine. How it will help? This love for the divine is going to make your mind calm. How? That it is something which is the only desire. The love for all other things is external. This love for the divine is the only thing for which you need not have to depend on something external. It is something intrinsic. So the love, the obsession which develops, there is nothing to obscure it, to obstruct it. When my desire is for something outside, it can be obscured and that entails suffering. If something which cannot be obscured, just I think of the God it is with me, the world can never take away from me. No one can steal it from me. There is no question of that obscuring of that love. And that can take me to that eternal bliss, eternal placidness. That's the basic difference between the good and evil. So it is from the God, the same good and the evil has evolved. There is no need to think of Satan as the from whom all the evil has emanated. It's the same bliss which we all are searching. If it is if we know the way the psyche works and if we can just change our orientation, we will find the same, the same thing which was giving me sorrow as it becomes the cause of my happiness. What's the same thing? The mind. This mind can take me spirally spiral downwards, it can take me spirally upwards. So how I orient myself on that depends the way the mind is going to guide me. And that's why so when Sri Ramakrishna is saying that both the, the God, from God, the good and evil has tendencies have evolved. He's actually speaking of the philosophy of Vedanta. There is how nicely we did not have to think of some separate being to define, to explain the evil. Both are from him. That's the motivation for the bliss. That is the divine. When it takes the wrong direction, then it becomes evil. When it takes the proper channel, that itself becomes something good. So, in that case, we aren't are uh, we aren't responsible for our sinful actions, are we? So, if God has created good and evil, then are we responsible for our sinful actions? So here Sri Ramakrishna again will be saying something which is significant. Sin begets its own result. This is God's law. Won't you burn your tongue if you chew a chili? So this is the thing that which in Vedanta is the concept of rhythm. The concept of rhythm is wonderful. That the absolute, when the real, real, the absolute reality, when it is not, it is not finding expression as a phenomenal world. That absolute reality uh, is something which is beyond all good and evil. But when it finds expression as this phenomenal existence, it finds expression as shakti, as energy. The world is nothing but the manifestation of energy. The absolute finds expression as energy. But again, very interesting, the next thing is very interesting. But that energy is not chaotic. It's not like just an explosion to destroy everything. That energy follows laws. In nature, you will find everywhere that law is being followed. The law of gravitation, which is applicable here, is applicable anywhere in the universe. That's why so perfectly we can launch a rocket and do a soft landing on the Mars. Because the same law of gravitation works. With that, we have calculated. I can do that precisely. That's why Einstein, the famous quotation, the most incomprehensible fact of the universe is that it is comprehensible. That it is as it is, fall, is following certain law, universal laws. It makes the thing, it, it's such a vast universe. It was not supposed to be comprehensible. I was not supposed to know it. Why I know it? Because the laws are universal. So that makes me comprehensible. And that is the most incomprehensible fact of the universe, that how everything is bound by the laws. So that's the thing in Vedanta has been spoken of as rhythm. That energy finds expression as rhythm, as laws. Very interesting. All the languages are linked. You find the English word rhythm is so similar to rhythm. From the rhythm, the word rhythm came. 
lost, everything is in loss. And this is fixed for sustenance of the creation, the way there are, there's the law of gravitation, there's the law of electromagnetism. Similarly, there's a moral loss. All the religion speaks of commandments, do's and don'ts. Now it is, we say we don't believe. It's just foolishness to say we don't believe. By not believing in the perennial values in 200 years, we are, are on the brink of extinction. All that we were exploiting the nature in such, such a way but that we find that all the, at the present is the global warming, everything. What it speaks of? Laws can never be broken. Just the way if you say, I don't believe in gravitation, are you going to fly? I knew I, when I came in 2013 in Sydney, just a few months after I came, an incident happened. From a multi story building, one boy in, in the presence of his father and mother, he was under the effect of some synthetic drug. Suddenly he felt he can fly. In presence of father and mother, he forced himself to just dash out of the window from a multi story building and crashed and died. Well, I mean, it's, a very, it's a very tragic incident, but what we mean to say that because of the effect of the drug, he felt that he can fly. The gravitation is as if not there. Is it really going to happen? That as you believe that there is no gravitation, are you going to fly? Never. The law, you can never break the laws. In our attempt to break laws, we break ourselves. So this all this, this tendency to manifest that bliss is there in each and every being. But how we experience that bliss, that is our choice. Just the way he's giving the example of the chili. There's a plate of chili kept in the dining table. If I, whether I, if I, it is my choice, whether I will take the chili or not. I take the chili and I eat it. And I say, I, I want to just enjoy the flavor of the chili, but I do not like that hotness. Can you avoid the hotness after eating the chili? No. There is choice. Of course, there is a choice. Whether I will eat the chili or not, the choice is there. But I will eat the chili and I, will, I won't feel that hot sensation. That's never going to be. That, there is the law is fixed. So that's what Sri Ramakrishna is saying. But in that case, are we not responsible? We are responsible. In what way? That everything that God has created, the tendencies, the bad tendencies and good tendencies, they are what they're both the our endeavor to find bliss but if we take the wrong choice we are going to suffer no one can save us so sin begets its own result that's what master is saying this is god's law that's the rhythm won't you burn your tongue if you chew a chili so if you don't well and good if you take you're going to burn the chili the tongue and then what ramakrishna is saying is in his youth mathur led a rather fast life so he suffered from various diseases before his death. The next thing which he says is also very interesting. With that, we will end our discussion today. One may not realize this in youth. I have looked into the hearth in a kitchen, in the kitchen of the Kali temple, where logs are being burned. At first, the wet wood burns rather well. It doesn't seem that it contains much moisture. But when the wood is sufficiently burned, all the moisture runs back to one end. At last, water squids from the fuel and put the fire out. So what he's saying is interesting that Mathur had a very licentious way of living as a young person. And no effect was visible, just like this log wood. It's only the old age in the, in the form of various ailments. His that fast life found the what is it, that all the evil effects was found was finding expression in his last days in the form of various type of elements. So Sri Ramakrishna, what he's saying after giving that example of chili. So sometimes we may have the idea that when you eat the chili, instantly you feel the hot sensation. But in our life, for all our wrongdoings, <clears throat> there are so many instances where immediately nothing happens. That's what Sri Ramakrishna is saying here. That 
It may not be instantaneous, but it is going to happen. <clears throat> That's what we often realize in our life as a society. We have made so many historical blunders with all our bragging with our science and everything. After 200 years, we are saying we have made some historical blunders. So it was not instantaneous. But the result is waiting for you. It may be not instantaneous, just like the chili, but it is waiting for you. It, that today or tomorrow, its effect is bound to find expression through our life. We have to experience it. That's what Sri Ramakrishna is saying. You'll find very interesting, very simple examples. He is just clarifying the intricacies of the philosophical thoughts lying behind the Vedanta. So we'll continue with our discussion again in the next class. With this, we stop our discussion today. Thank you all. Namaskar.